Welcome to our second Pollinators Week webinar with Dr. Colin Geiselman. My name is Laura Venner and I'm the Global and Public Health Officer for SAVMA. Before we get started, please make sure to stay muted during the duration of our webinar. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop it into the chat. And my elect, Ashley Miller and I, will help field questions during and after the webinar. Um, just a few reminders before we get started. This webinar will be recorded and posted to our SAVMA YouTube channel. We will be sharing the links with the SAVMA delegates, so be on the lookout in the coming weeks with those links, um, probably in the coming week, I should say. Um, also, don't forget to take a screenshot of you in the webinar and tag the SAVMA social media pages for a chance to win a $25 gift card for attending. Um, so let's get started. I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Colin Geiselman. Um, Dr. Geiselman uh, holds a BA in Environmental Science and Policy from Duke University and an MA and PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from Columbia University. Her research focuses on seed dispersal and pollination by bats, and she co-authored a book with botanists from the New York Botanical Gardens entitled Sea Dispersal by Bats in the Neotropics. She chairs the board of the Bat Conservation of Bat Conservation International, a US-based not-for-profit organization dedicated to the conservation of bats and their habitats worldwide. She also serves on the board of directors of the Houston Zoo, the Houston Arboretum and Nature Center, the Houston Parks Board, the Houston Advanced Research Center, and the Turtle Conservancy. Dr. Geiselman curates the Bat Eco Interactions Database which catalogs all published interactions between bats and other organisms to facilitate scientific research on bats, their diets, and the ecosystems uh, they serve to provide. In addition to her bat research and board duties, she is the acting director and board chair for the Cullen Trust for Healthcare, a support organization funding healthcare-related initiatives in the greater Houston area. So please welcome Dr. Geiselman. Dr. Geiselman, I am gonna pass it off to you. Great, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. And y'all have to bear with me. This is the first um, PowerPoint I've ever given on Zoom. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited, but hopefully you, this will, and holler if there's no, there's um, any issues. And I'm thrilled to be here to speak with you today. I um, am an uh, animal lover, meaning I'm a vet lover because I um, see my vet a lot. I have old animals. And I'm also very involved with Houston Zoo where I get to hang out and it might be the coolest job ever to be a zoo veterinarian. Um, anyway, they're amazing people doing really amazing work. And I know you guys are all um, uh, incredible to be able to actually be in vet school right now. That's, um, it's not easy. I feel like it's harder to go to vet school than to actual medical school, is my understanding. So it must be a smart group here. Um, and please put your questions in the chat box. I can go, my presentation isn't super long, but I am, um, and I'm happy to go back to the slides and we can talk about different stuff and I can expound more if you, if you would like. So here we're gonna, I'm gonna kick it off here and going to share my screen here and hopefully get my, get all this up and going. And um, anyway, so happy um, to uh, to be with you for this National Pollinator Week, um, celebrating our pollinators. And we were discussing um, before the call started or the webinar started about uh, how important it is to start incorporating some of these pollinators, particularly honeybees and, and other animals that are domestic animals um, that are pollinators in your work. And so. Um, I'm here to talk to you about an animal or animals that you probably will not see very often um, in, in your vet practice, but you might if you get more into um, working uh, uh, in outside of your basic domestic animal work. So, and there's lots of opportunity. I have some interesting colleagues in Rwanda that work with uh, gorillas that are veterinarians um, and many others that are really important. Actually, some of the bat researchers I know are veterinarians and have gone on to um, focus in this One Health initiative, which obviously is a really interesting thing to do right now, given the emerging coronavirus and pandemic. So anyway, as, as um, I was introduced, my name is Colin Geiselman, and I did and do study bats that pollinate plants. And I'm entitled my talk, 
nectar feeding bats, the hummingbirds, and sunbirds of the night. And that's mainly because a lot of people don't associate bats with pollinators. And usually when people think of bat or think of pollinators, they think of butterflies and they think of particularly bees and maybe even hummingbirds. And what I love about this particular image is that um, they did a stamp back in the late 90s, a pollinator stamp, probably when a lot of this pollinator, the National Pollinator Week was being kicked off. And they actually included bats. And we as bat people, um, I was working for Bat Conservation International at the time, were really excited to um, for people to know that bats are pollinators. And just as I don't I need to remind any of you, but a pollinator is essentially um, an animal that visits a flower and gets pollen from the male part of the plant, the stamen attached to it somehow, and then goes on to another plant, a flower of the same species, usually on a different plant, and deposits that pollen inadvertently on the stigma or the female part of the, of the, of the plant. And in sense, moving the pollen from one plant to another, helping the plant to reproduce. So a lot of people don't think of bats doing this, and that's usually because A, it's happening at night, usually B, way above where we um, can see up in the canopy of many trees, and C, usually in the tropics. So most of us are not out night, at, out at night in the tropics in a tree canopy, so you don't really get to witness this behavior a lot. Um, uh, but indeed, bats are some important mammal pollinators. Um, and some of these plants that I'm going to speak with you about are um, important ecologically, whether they're in rainforests or deserts. Also, some are very important economically for people. And this is again occurring in the tropical and subtropical parts of the Americas and Asia, Africa, Australia, and some South Pacific islands where bats are the only native land animals in many places. So um, they're, they're functioning in many different ways. And just to iterate, reiterate the tropical phenomenon, here is a screenshot from my website, Bat Eco Interactions, um, that is cataloging all these different interactions among bats and, and other, um, other animals and plants and all other living things. And you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or uh, my, my pointer here, that all of these are, interactions with uh, known published interactions of bats and, uh, and plants as, as, um, as either the bat is visiting the flower for nectar or is actually known to pollinate it. And so you can see this is mainly happening in the tropics. So to the hummingbird and sunbird part of my talk, um, since so few people don't know about bats as pollinators, I like to talk and sort of get people up to speed by referring to hummingbirds. And I assume most everyone here knows what a hummingbird is. You've seen them in action, you've seen them somewhere, and um, you know they're these little feisty animals that buzz around and have like 400 heartbeats per minute or something crazy. Anyway, really amazing animals. And, um, and what I think is very cool is that we do know a lot about hummingbirds. We live here in the United States. Hummingbirds are only found in, or I guess maybe some people on the scholar from other parts of the world, um, they're only found in the Americas, or what ecologists and geolog uh, geographers refer to as the New World, so the, um, the essentially the Americas. And they have a specialized diet on and special adaptations for feeding on nectar, though many of them also eat insects. And so they have these long bills and long tongues, and they're very small, and they're able to hover. Um, and interestingly enough, over in the Old World, which is Asia, Africa, Australia, um, they, there is a different type of bird called a sunbird, and it too has a long specialized bill and has long tongues. They're generally smaller in size, um, but unlike hummingbirds, they do not hover. And hummingbirds and sunbirds are not actually at all closely rela related evolutionarily. Um, however, they've come to be similar, look similar, and, fun and, and function in a similar way because of this nectar feeding lifestyle due to convergent evolution. And as you might expect, the same thing is actually happening in our nectar feeding bats. Um, so there are approximately 100 different species of bats out of the nearly 1400 species known around the world that visit flowers for nectar pollen or sort of these fleshy flower parts that they eat. And again, this is mainly in the tropics. 
And these species are divided into two families of bats. Those in the old world um, are called, are, are part of a family called Carapodidae, which is a group of vegetarian bats that are re restricted to the period pockets. And 38 species from 17 genera in this family have been reported to, to be visiting flowers. Now over in the new world, over in the Americas, there's a different, a different group of nectar feeding bats. And they're all from one family called the Phylostomidae, which is actually the new world leaf nose bat family. And this is a group of bats that in some are insectivores, some are omnivores, some are frugivores, some are carnivores, others are sanguivores, the vampire bats are in this family. And then you have some nectarivores. Um, and again, these are all bats found in the neotropics. In 58 species of these new world leaf nose bats, um, of 29 genera have been reported visiting flowers. Um, and despite having um, a nectarivorous um, lifestyle, again, these families are not close real, closely related. And nectar feeding has evolved multiple times, independent times within each of these families too. And so it's quite like the hummingbird and sunbird situation. And many of these families are pretty old. The old world fruit bats are, are approximately, the family has been around for approximately 56 million years, where the new world family has been around for um, maybe 39 million years. Um, and so over time, they've, they've evolved to um, take on different feeding um, styles. Whoops. So what's also interesting, I know this is a slide that you can see what some of these cute little bats, I think they're cute, um, what their faces look like. And um, for the most part, the flower visiting bats and the pteropodidae are larger um, and, uh, and they can anywhere range in size from a thousand grams, which is about 2.2 pounds, while those in the new world group, the phylostomidae, weigh anywhere between 50 and 100 grams, sort of less than two ounces. So they do, they're quite different in size in most cases. Um, and interestingly, the bottom squares, the bottom two squares on both sides are, um, are, are, are opportunistic nectar feeding bats. These bats don't particularly have um, uh, specialized anatomy for nectar feeding. But what's also interesting is that um, despite that, some of them are the are more impo important pollinators um, because they're very directional. They only visit a very few number of plant species, and um, and so increased morphology for a feeding adaptation such as nectar feeding bats doesn't actually make bats these particular specialized bats better pollinators. It just makes them better adapted for intaking nectar. Um, with their, you can see the ones up at the top, those top four squares, where they have elongated snouts and um, they that support and an elongated tongue um, in many cases. One nectar bat that was discovered maybe 10 to 15 years ago in Ecuador has a tongue that's a third it's the length of its body and it sort of stows it down in its chest cavity. It's really quite an amazing. And as far as it's probably the mammal with the longest tongue and compared to its in relationship to its body. Really an amazing, we adapted plant, uh, bat, but it only visits a few um, plant species. So, um, so it's really, I find all of that really uh, very fascinating. Um, and, and so what does it really look like? And now I'm gonna have to actually, I can't figure out how to do this video in my actual PowerPoint. So we're gonna, I'm gonna bring up another, um, another screen to show you the video. Let's see if I can do this right. Sorry, I'm, I'm being technically challenged here. Can we help you? Oh, here, I'm just trying to get, oh, here's my script. Share my screen again. Okay, now let's see, here we go. Now 
Can you see that? I'm gonna play a video. Now, before I play it, the, you'll see the little arrow. Can y'all see the little arrow pointing at what looks like some green beans? Yes, we can see it. Okay, mm -hmm. those are actually flower buds and you're gonna see them pop open. And, um, and this is happening at about 100 feet in the canopy in French Guiana. So I'm gonna play it now. And um, it's a very short video and there's no sound. And so be watching, it's 7.38 p.m. And, um, and so those little green beans um, will begin to pop open. That's what you're seeing there, sort of pop, they're beginning to expand. And literally four minutes later, the bats arrive and they're going really fast. So these are the hovering type bats that live in the new world um, that are specialized for this nectar diet that mainly eat nectar, though sometimes eat bugs. And you can see how quickly they go. These flower visits are very short. See, there's one. And wait, we'll I'll have a little slow-mo moment where um, you'll be able to see the bat come to the flower. Um, and here it is. There it is. So that is, that is a, a bat visiting a flower. Um, so uh, pretty amazing. Um, what they do there. So let me pull up my, my PowerPoint again and, um, and share my screen again. Okay, so what does it look like to make this to make this video. So I made this video when I was doing my PhD in, um, in French Guyana in 2000, this video is from 2007, 2008. And um, in order to capture this video, you need to have a Sony camcorder put in a plastic box with a night vision or uh, a UV, or not a UV, an infrared light that's run by a motorcycle battery that's dangling down in that red pouch and I'm about 100 feet up in the canopy. And so I know the footage is not beautiful, but that it's hard work to get up there and, and um, see these bats. But here are better, if you can take pictures within a studio of bats, this is what they look like. And there on the left, you can see a very long tongue um, on some of these nectar feeding bats, and then also um, a cross section of a bat visiting a cactus flower. And you can see how they stick their heads right in there and they get a ton of pollen. So what about the plant end of this whole equation? So there have been over 500 plant species from 67 families um, that have been reported to have their flowers visited by bats. And when I keep saying visited is a lot of the pollination has not been confirmed on many of these cases. We can't be for sure that the plant is producing fruit because, um, the, because of the um, visit from the bat. So, but we can know that the bat actually visits them. So, um, so 500 plant species from 67 families, well, that, that's some that have been witnessed by people. Um, and so that seems like a lot until you realize there are over 200,000 known species of flowering plants in the world. So the numbers of plants that are actually relying on bats for pollination is somewhat small. Um, but um, there's a, quite a diversity of them. But what's interesting among many of these plants is that they um, all start looking, they all have sort of similar features. Um, despite being not being closely related. And so that's mainly because they're all attracting um, large nocturnal colorblind flying pollinators. And so that means many of there's sort of what we call a pollination syndrome. So that many of these plants, um, they might have white flowers that are very easy to see at night. Um, they, or they could be drab in coloration. So if you see uh, the um, image that is sort of a reddish looking flower um, and you can see a wood background, that's actually the flower that was in the video, the showy mistletoe um, that's pollinated by bats. Um, anyway, they, they, they can be drab in color. Um, they frequently are either cup shaped or have sort of a ball of stamens. And many of them produce a lot of nectar, anywhere from 10 microliters to 15 milliliters. That's like three tablespoons of nectar. It's quite a lot. Many of them are musky, produce a musky smell that seems to um, alert bats with a very good sense of smell that, the, that there is um, uh, flowers ready to be visited. 
Um, and many of them are placed away from foliage. You're dealing with a pretty large um, pollinator flying around. And it's easier if they don't have to get all up in the foliage. And so, um, um, and also many bats, there are actually some observations of bats being attacked and, and consumed by snakes hanging out in flowering trees. So that's sort of, they're wary of predators at their, at their food plant. Um, so that's another reason that the flowers should be away from the foliage. Um, so this seems like a lot of work for a plant to, in order to attract a bat as a pollinator, and maybe it should have just sort of stuck with bees or butterflies or something else. Um, but there, are, but these costs are, in, in some of these cases, outweighed by the benefits of having a really large body pollinator where many different, this pollinator, the pollen can be put in various different places throughout its body. Um, as well as bats are flying huge distances. They can go, um, you know, 30 plus kilometers or even more in a night. Um, and so they can carry large pollen loads um, far distance. It really helps outcrossing in plants. Um, so there, you know, there are a lot of costs, but there are also a lot of benefits. And you might re recognize some of these flowers here of plants that you've heard of. Um, some you've definitely probably never heard of, but you can see there's a banana plant here. Um, there's also the agave plant, that's from, and I'll talk more about agaves here, they're cactus flowers. So you actually would know some of these plants um, that rely on bats in the wild to pollinate them. And bat pollination and, and relying on bats as pollinators has evolved many, many different times. We think 85% of the bat pollinated species evolved from uh, another species that was not pollinated by bats. And here I'm showing you some images of bats or of, of um, plants that were this the that were either originally evolved from bird pollinated species or moth pollinated species, bee pollinated species, and even large mammal pollinated species. Um, so, the, so this phenomenon has happened over and over and over again. It's not all necessarily nested within, um, you know, individual clades within plants. So what does this really mean for you guys? Like, why would you, why do you really, why would you care? Why would someone else really want to know? What is it, you know, we're people that come out during the day. We're in the United States. Um, we're most of us, at least. Um, so what does this really mean for us? And so in some of these instances, um, Bats are really important pollinators of very large dominant tree species in tropical wet and dry forests. And so they're actually helping to sustain these ecosystems from which we get so much of the oxygen on our planet. So that's a, one reason. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, bats are also important pollinators of some economically important plants such as durian. Um, I don't know if anyone on this on this webinar has um, enjoyed a durian. It's a, it's a prized delicacy in Asia, these very large um, plants worth millions of dollars of their crops. Um, they're a little stinky apparently. I've never eaten one, I've only seen them in markets. And then wild relatives of bananas are actually pollinated by bats, where currently all um, bananas that we buy in the grocery store are triploid, meaning they don't require pollination. Um, but they're wild relatives that we need to um, continue to get healthy genetic stock um, are bat pollinated. And then what might make many of you, um, and I'll speak on more, um, is bats are the main pollinators of agave from which we get tequila. And so this is another reason how bats might relate to your life. Next time you have a margarita, you can think about bats, that they are the important pollinators of that plant. Um, so Unfortunately, many bats are, are in decline. Many species of the 1,400 species of bats out there, there um, many of them are in decline for various reasons, either from loss of habitat, either from fires, from urbanization, from you'll see those sort of pools there, that's gold mining in French Guiana where I used to live, um, as well as the bushmeat trade. Um, we've seen, we've heard a lot about bushmeat this year. And the image there is actually some hunters from American Samoa. It's a, it's a native delicacy to, um, for them to eat bats. Or it's the only native land mammal in American Samoa. But once people have guns, they can kill whole colonies. And so um, tempering the consumption of bats with um, sort of sustainable harvest is important. And then finally, climate change, is, as we've heard about in Australia um, on the bottom left image, 
they are actually a bunch of dead flying foxes that during the drought and heat wave um, died from um, dehydration. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of threats that bats are facing, and each species is facing different threats. But there's some silver linings, um, and with some concerted effort, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Bat Conservation International is doing for our nectar feeding bats. Um, what's going on actually here in the United States and down in Mexico. So welcome to um, the desert southwestern United States and northern desert part of Mexico. And this is the home of the agave, which I've mentioned many times. And all those spiky things that look like plants from a Dr. Seuss book, um, those are the agave plants. And the large stalks um, are their flowering stalks that they shoot up. Um, and it's interesting that these plants are also called century plants. They can live a very long time, but they only flower once. They, they can serve all of their sugars and energy to shoot up this one flowering stalk before they die um, to produce um, fruit and seeds, and, um, and, then they, and then they die. And the bats are their main pollinators. So, and here are some of the bats um, that actually do come up uh, in our nectar feeding bats in the United States. We have three nectar feeding species known from uh, West Texas and Southern Arizona and New Mexico. Two of the species happen to be um, considered threatened and that's the lesser long-nosed bat. And then one that's actually considered in danger, the Mexican long-nosed bat. And they follow the blooming of the agave up and you can see on this map their range. And so they follow a species of agave bloom up into the United States and then they come back down um, and return to Mexico for the rest of the year. It's sort of what we consider a, um, a flowering corridor for these bats. And a lot of them fly up into the, into the US to have their babies in the summer and then they fly back down into Mexico. Um, and so, as I said, these are, these are all cave dwelling species and each mom, each female, gives birth to one young, which we call a pup, once per year during this uh, migration up into the United States. Um, and so um, she's really amazing and can give birth to a young that's about the third the size of her body. And some bats actually produce a quarter of their body weight in a 24 hour period in milk, which is really amazing. Um, so, and they're great moms, and at night they leave all their babies together in their cave roosts um, before the babies learn to fly. And then they go and fly out and feed on nectar of the agaves. And some, they're flying, you know, 30 to 50 kilometers in a night. Many of them do what we call flock foraging. They actually fly together as groups um, and, uh, and find plants throughout the landscape and then return in the morning to their young to feed their young milk. And, um, and these are some of our nectar corridors. Unfortunately, some of these places, these corridors have been disrupted due to overgrazing, over harvesting of agaves and other forms of habitat modification. So if the bats have too far to fly um, to find agaves, they're not able to actually sustain their movement. Um, but Bat Conservation International and some Mexican collaborators are working to reestablish these nectar corridors where they have disappeared by working with local communities. And you can see on the right of the screen are actually baby agave plants that have been head started. And on the left, you can see the, um, some folks from Bat Conservation International working with local communities and um, supporting their efforts to replant these head started. Um, uh, plants. And so here you can see some of the baby plants in the community down there planting agave um, so that uh, over time, again, these plants live for a very long time, will begin to grow up um, more plants. Um, in addition to the, the head starting, you also, we are also relying on conservation easements on key properties. And so people can be paid to maintain their agaves. And you know they have their have a market drive to cut them down to make various products. And here instead we can pay them to keep the agaves in the ground. And both by planting agaves and developing these easements brings income to the local economies. Um, and um, they start stewarding their land for the agaves and, and also then for the bats. 
So um, over the next decade, we hope and our plan is to plant a million agaves to maintain these nectar corridors. And so it's good for bats and it's also good for people because agaves help hold the soil, which decreases erosion. They provide food for other animals. And, um, and they're also an important part of the local communities that make their traditional drink, mezcal and tequila from agave. So we want them to be able to sustain those efforts. So here's the, the fun part how you make tequila or in a scalp. So on the very left of the screen, you can see the basil rosette of the agave plant. And there he, there is a man that is, um, has cut down the stalk. In order to concentrate the sugars into the basil rosette of the plant, they have to cut down the flowering stalk before it flowers, which means no food for bats. And so, um, and so, and then just following along, you can see in the next image, that is the piece of the agave plant that the man then boils down. And you can see on the right of the screen is actually the concentrated sugars from that, um, from the boiling process. And it's that that they ferment in order to make mezcal and tequila. And that's one of the reasons mezcal has that smoky taste is that is actually um, been cooked over a wood fire and has a sense, uh, sense of smokiness. So, how do we balance the production of, of tequila and mezcal with promoting bat habitat if in order to make the tequila, they actually have to cut down the flowering stalk before it actually flowers? And here's where our collaborators at the University of Mexico come in because they are working with small producers to actually produce bat-friendly tequila. And this is tequila where the producer allows at least 5% of his crop to flower every year in a sense provides food for the bats and um and then he can market his tequila with a special little sign bat friendly um tequila and so he can market his tequila for a higher price um, mainly in the united states but also in mexico so you can look up for these to find out what are bat what bat friendly tequilas you can purchase i purchase mine sometimes from total wine by looking up at the tequila interchange project you can find out um, more about how to get yourself some bat friendly tequila so it's, a, it's really a, you know, a win-win for everybody. So it's a win-win for the various bats and a win-win for the people in Mexico. And so we're really proud of that project um, and sort of a, a, a sense of this One Health initiative of uh, the health of the bats, the health of the communities there, and um, driven by potentially a market here in the United States. So with that, um, I wanted to say thank you. Um, for uh, inviting me to come and speak with you and then I can stop sharing my screen or can go back to other other slides and take your question. That's a really cute picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually not a nectar feeding bat. That is a California bigger bat. A bat is found in California and it um, is a gleaning insectivore. It actually picks up, it can hear with its giant ears the sound of a cricket walking on sand and will swoop in, not even use its echolocation, and grab up the cricket and eat it. Um, but he's really cute. So that just kind <laughs> of <a> cliche. Wow. <laughs> um, so we got a couple questions um, from our chat. Um, first off, um, is there a way to phenotypically identify pollinating bats as compared to like carnivorous bats, or do you just have to know the species? I think you have to know, you know the species and just like anything in nature, it's a little messy. So the nectar feeding bat that I, um, that I studied in French Guiana also eat insects, um, just like hummingbirds also eat insects um, um, during different times of the year. And, and I could show, I didn't want to overload you with people hate cladograms and then people that are taxonomists love them. And I'm happy to, I could, I'm, I'm happy to share with the group some, some, um, some of those, but you do generally, um, they, they have, nectar feeding has evolved multiple times. We have some of these that are opportunistic nectar feeders um, that, and other, in places where they don't have, happen to have that particular plant, won't ever visit plants and will just be um, carnivores or insectivores. Um, and then you have others that are more obligate and they're multiple, and this has evolved multiple times, but there are various nectar feeding clades among them. Um, so you can actually see that. And then phenotypically, I would say, um, again, it, it, it somewhat depends. There's some, the specialized ones, you can definitely tell they have a long nose and a long tongue and a rather diminutive, very small teeth, um, where the, but you can also have these omnivores that are important pollinators. Um, right. Yeah. 
That's really interesting. Um, so how can we uh, help change the perception of bats so that the community understands their importance and wants to help protect them? Ah, this is a great question. And part of it, I think, is just providing facts and showing some of these fun images. They're, um, to me, of course, I think all bats, even the, the, the what most people would consider ugly bats, um, are really kind of amazing and cute. And part of what um, Bat Conservation International has been around for almost 40 years, and part of what they've been doing is just getting, getting people information and then showing them some really amazing pictures of bats where their teeth aren't showing and they don't look like they're gonna attack you or hurt you and um, providing information. I think also talking about the services that they provide um, really uh, interests people because then they can see how, why they themselves might be interested in bats. Like why, you know, what does it mean to me? Um, I think as part of it, dispelling myths and anyone, and the exciting thing is anyone can do it. There's lots of information out there about, about bats. There's some interesting programs and interesting YouTube things where you too can go out and, and do that. I, we've been, well, now it's the time we're all supposed to be sheltering at home or, or whatever, not interacting in big groups. But one of the things that I do um, multiple times a year here in Houston is I take bat walks of people out at the Houston Arboretum. And I go out with my bat detector, detects the high frequency sounds that bats make and turns it into something that humans can hear. And I go, we go out and walk around at dusk and it's really fun to be outside and see the bats flying around. And some groups pair this with having a little tequila tasting and people can get out and you can actually observe bats unlike, um, sort of like birds, but in many ways prior to really teaching people how to do this, they don't really have a chance to see, to see and enjoy them the way that we go and enjoy other wildlife and bringing that to people. I think part of it with bats we're starting and this is where veterinarians are really, really important to um, provide basic information where people, you know, people start off in, in many cases, a natural fear of that, kind of like spiders. Mm -hmm. And so providing them some, you know, showing that they're mammals and they're, they have hair just like us and they feed their babies milk. And I have amazing stories about I um, when I was catching bats, the way I determined what, what plants they were visiting, I couldn't film in the canopy all the time. I had to, um, I would capture them on their, on their way back to their cave early, early in the morning. And the moms um, of these particular species I was looking at, they, um, they carry their, when their babies, before their babies get way too big, but the babies are literally a third to, um, to almost half their body size. They're flying with them. And on occasion, a mom would get caught in my net, this mist net type thing, sort of similar to what you catch birds in. And the mom would get um, caught up in the net and she would free herself, but her non volant baby, her baby that couldn't fly, would be stuck in the net. And by the time I would get up there to take it out, there was no mom there. And I, would, I was just heartbroken. And so in two different instances with two different species that kept these babies, um, or the one baby, um, and I, I fed it because I was living in the middle of nowhere, you know, with you know, no electricity or anything. Um, I fed, fed it powdered milk. I mixed up a little powdered milk and I fed it throughout the day. And I took it back at dusk to the same spot where I caught it at dawn. And lo and behold, in both instances, the moms remembered, we're like a mile from their cave home. The moms remembered where they lost their babies. And they, she came and found them and came and collected her baby and flew off. And providing stories like that, that we're like, whoa, that's so, it's a mammal. It cares about its young, just like people care about their young. And uh, I think providing those instances and, and sort of some interesting stories um, make people more interested and make it seem less scary and, and, and different. And I think people originally, before all this coronavirus stuff, used to be afraid of bats because of rabies. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have to think about these other, these other um, things that you should never, I guess, you know, vets, you have to tell people, don't pick up wildlife. You know, it's, you know that's not safe for you or for the animal. And, um, and being and informing yourself because you are frequently the first go-to when someone has an animal question is they, I imagine they call their vet. They also call the zoo a lot. The zoo gets lots of funny calls, but guess who answers those calls? Their vets. Yeah. <laughs> you have to get stuck with answering those, call, those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree. I think it's so important to make sure that we're not just categorizing all of them into, you know, the carnivorous, the, the Halloween bat or the, 
it's the, you know, there's so many different types of species out there. Um, so we've got another question. Um, are these pollinating bats affected by white nose syndrome or are they not in the same geographic region? Okay, this is a great question. So far, they are not in the same geographic region. And the interesting thing, I'm not sure how much you guys know about white nose syndrome. So it is an invasive species. It's a fungus, a soil fungus that most likely came over on the sole of someone's boot from Europe. And um, that person went into a bat cave and that and deposited accidentally, probably someone that went into a European cave and went and got an American cave and accidentally deposited the spores of this fungus in a cave in New York. And we, we know exactly the epicenter where it started in Albany and, um, and outside of Albany. And then this disease, this fungal disease, um, attacks bats that are hibernating. And so when a bat hibernates, um, these are only in temperate bat species, they drop their body temperature to that of their surroundings so that they can decrease um, their energy expenditure. So they don't, um, so their heart barely beats, they barely breathe, their immune system pretty much shuts down. And so this fungus just sort of starts eating their tissue. And in some ways it changes their water balance um, as well. And so the bats wake up and, they're, and it irritates their skin. And so every time a bat wakes up from hibernation, which they do multiple times during hibernation and kind of reset themselves, um, they burn a lot of energy, a lot of their fat reserves. And if they wake up too many times to groom themselves and then go get water because they're thirsty because this, uh, this fungus is attacking them, they end up starving to death before their bugs outside to eat and before winter's over. And so this fungus has been actually predominantly spread probably by bats. We at first were really worried that it was being spread by people going into caves and then going into other caves. But the, the caving community and a lot of the bat scientists really cut that down. And so people are it's mainly now being spread by bats because bats move around. But even bats that hibernate frequently migrate in order to hibernate. And so they're moving this fungus around. And it has gone from New York, um, is in most of the eastern United States. Um, all the way over here, we have found the fungus um, in Texas, and it's gotten into Oklahoma. And in some, in some crazy way, it hopped, skipped, and jumped all the way from potentially the Midwest over to the Washington state down there. So, um, so what does this have to do with nectar feeding bats? Well, two things right now is that they they do not overlap in range, and also these nectar feeding bats are in different family of bats that do not actually hibernate and barely use torpor. They have to be hot all the time, which means that they are never, their immune system is never down to a low level and they groom themselves every day, multiple times a day. And so that would keep the spore funguses off of them. So we don't think this will harm those types of bats that are active all the time or our Mexican free tailed bats that actually um, do overlap in range. But those bats go into torpor periodically, but not, um, but don't do a full on hibernation. Wow, that's really scary. I didn't realize that it was um, spread by bats. It's yeah, it's probably spread. It was originally came to the United States probably from human, but then as it's moving from cave to cave, it's, people are taking such major decontamination processes. They go in, now when you go into a bat cave, you have to be in full on Tyvex with respirators and gloves and all this stuff to decrease and then decontaminate any equipment that had been in the cave. And so it's most likely now the bats are spreading it. Um, so yeah, and, and it, it we're, there's a lot of different projects in order to try to decrease and, or delay the spread of this fungus throughout the United States. We understand that the huge decline in bats, we're talking about like 95% decline in certain very common, that had been very common species like the little brown bat. Um, it, it's, um, we know about these declines because we have really good numbers um, because these bats hibernate in really large colonies. Mm -hmm. So, but out in the Western United States, bats don't do that. We don't, they're not big congregations of hibernating bats. They're definitely hibernating. We just don't know where and in small numbers. And so we don't quite know what, it, when it, as it moves West, what it's going to do. Yeah. Um, still really unknown. That's really sad. And I mean, it's, there are such big parts of the ecosystem as well that the impacts could be pretty yeah. severe. But th this is again where veterinarians could be really important. There are a lot of researchers are researching this stuff. They're trying to do it in labs. They're anointing bats with their different antifungal agents and doing various different things. But for people to really understand um, the health of animals and 
it's not something like someone like me, like an ecologist, I, I know what they're like in the wild, but keeping and caring for them in captivity and um, in their, in their for medical health um, requires veterinarians. And so there is a chance if anyone was super interested in this, like that's something that you could be, that veterinarians certainly are, are uh, and again, back to the, back to um, the idea of um, sort of ecological medicine um, mm -hmm. and helping and helping these wild populations, not just our domestic animals. It's really important. Very cool. And then we got one last question um, sent to us. It was, um, what did, what it, well, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what advice do you have for veteran or for young veterinarians who are interested in protecting and conserving bats? Well, again, I think educating yourself and there's huge amount of potential. I mean, again, I work with veterinarians in other parts of the world that are part of this, uh, of these One Health programs. And so if that is somewhere where you thought you might want to go in your studies, I would definitely look into, I think it's a big, there's a potential for a um, big field into this. Um, as well as if you're just, if you're being even a small animal vet, being prepared with information um to to let your your um the owner or the your the owners of your patients um <laughs> understand what's going on and and the questions that you might get you could get involved in local um local bat walks bat conservation international it's been somewhat on pause during this this um pandemic where we're, we're supposed to be socially isolating but we do this bat walk program where we're training up people how to go out with bat detectors and show people bats and talk to them and really engage local communities around getting to know their local bats. Um, so there's a there's a lot of potential there, and I'm happy to send information um, to folks you and um, and anyway and connect with you and help you however I can. Absolutely. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I don't see any more coming into the chat. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Geiselman. This was really a fantastic talk and. I feel like we really learned a lot about bats and how just their biology and how we can support them. This was really great. So thank you. Well, good. Well, thank you all and good luck with all of your studies. It's hard work. I'm so glad you guys are out. We need you. So, um, and again, if you, your, um, the, uh, your, the folks hoax hosting this um, series know how to get in touch with me and I'm happy to answer additional questions or help you with resources or any of that. Happy to do it. All right. Well, absolutely. Well, you're welcome to email Ashley or I if you guys um, would like to connect. Um, so thank you so much.